In this chapter, we're going to be covering goals, expectations, and meeting setup. I think that there are three really common use case scenarios for VR and engaging with someone else. Open house events, some large scale public meetings that are maybe in a gymnasium, um, Odd Fellows Hall, that kind of thing, in which you're trying to re reach a large group of people. Uh, small group sessions, these are things that are maybe like a council study session or maybe a small steering committee. People that are a little more involved in the process. And then lastly, I think that there's a really basic one of kind of the in-office, where it's just you and a client or maybe you know, a small group of only one or two people. And so each of one of these has kind of particular expectations, requirements, you know, slightly different approaches, and one of those is time. I think it's really easy to get focused on creating this experience and not being able to share it with enough people. And I think this is especially true in the open house scenario. In the Orem case study you saw earlier, we created a day-night cycle that was five minutes of daytime and one minute of night. So that allowed for six minutes per person uh, for them to, you know, that last minute was them kind of taking off the hardware and, and, and letting the next person get in. That was something we told them ahead of time, which is really important for us to set those expectations for those users so they're not surprised by it and say, hey, watch the sky. That's how much time you have you know, before we have to move on to the next person. One of the things just to consider is, are you asking questions that can be appropriately vetted and understood and answered within that time frame? And how are you going to be capturing that input? At the large scale open house, we had a number of stations, and we'll talk about some strategies for, for kind of multiple station setup later. But we, we were able to have multiple ones going at a time, which in turn required a lot, of, a, you know, a lot more facilitation. We needed a person at each one of those booths, plus a nerd running around making sure if there were any technical issues that they could get solved. And on top of that, we needed a really robust queuing system. And it could be robust is maybe not fair, but we needed one that, that would work. And if it's just you know, someone at the front of the line giving out you know, DMV style numbers, so that people you know, could understand when they would be next. If you're scheduling blocks of time and taking down numbers and texting them or names and calling them, some strategy just to make sure that system runs smoothly I think is really important. And the small group one, I think you can extend that amount of time. You know, what I like to do in this scenario is because you can go through a, a medium-sized number of people in an hour, hour and a half, is do it over a lunch course. You know, you'll have standard meeting preparation, Start feeding them, get the first person in the headset. Everyone else is still entertained doing something. You can have some more uh, low-tech engagement devices or at least have just a robust discussion while people are individually kind of being pulled off to the side and experiencing this and going through kind of the QA with that. I always suggest some background music for these kinds of things because you know, at the large open house event, it's this mulling mass of, you know, they're always very busy, lots of people, lots of sound. In the small group, sometimes it can be a little intimidating to have uh, it feel like a whole bunch, a whole room full of people are watching you quietly and judging you as you're, you know, you have this headset on, you can't, you know, you're doing these things, and, and it sometimes it can be a little intimidating. So if you have an activity and you have maybe a little ambient music, it can help make, set the mood a little bit and make people feel a little more at ease so they can be more open and engaged with that experience. And then the last one is kind of that in-office review. I mean, I think one person can do this. You can give them a, a ton of time in, inside the headset. Again, the strategy I've taken in the past has been to get people in there, let them review the work to date, feed them. Again, food's, al food's always helpful at all of these events. Um, and during that time, you can usually make a lot of the edits that they've uh, seen in the model. And so you can go through a whole review revise cycle over a lunch break and show progress Im immediately and let people you know, see the revised model the same day. And I think that's a very powerful experience. I can't tell you enough how helpful it was at that ORM event to have video recording just be the medium in which we use to capture people's input and doing you know, one-on-one -on -one interviews essentially while they're inside the headset enabled us to get these great anecdotes from people and make them feel like their comments were really being absorbed by the project team. In all of those settings, I would suggest a few approaches to help people feel comfortable. One is literally tell them to take a minute. If no one's put on this uh, VR headset like this and experienced a place like this, it can frankly be a little overwhelming. It's I don't want to say disconcerting, but it's certainly a very new experience to be in this virtual environment and have a connection to it, but have it also be very not reality-like. It's good to give them a moment and say, hey, take a minute, 
you know, use these buttons, teleport around just a little bit. I want you to feel comfortable before we dive into what I want to get out of you. And I think that can be a really good um, way to bring them into it and, and make them feel comfortable. One of the things I really like to do is have them put on the headset and then I hand them the controller or controllers. And because you can see the location of those controllers through the virtual reality environment, it's the first connection that they're going to have with this environment is you giving them this controller and them being able to grab a part of reality and, and still have this connection you know, to it within this virtual environment. And I think there's something a little subliminal there about, about you know, being still tethered to reality and having the spatial relationship connection. Comfort's really important. So like I said, make sure that they f you know, they're in an environment they feel like they can be themselves and they're not being judged for how wildly they're you know, gesticulating inside this VR environment. Do explain to them what the blue grid is. Uh, that's also referred to as a chaperone in any of the documentation you might have for the Vive. That's that clear space that you've predefined in the room scale setup. I've had a lot of people try to start running, very literally running, and you have to stop them before they yank a laptop off a table. And then lastly, at that point, I think it's appropriate to get into the questions. And you really need to have a predefined set of questions and information that you're trying to elicit from them. Because the experience can be, you know, overwhelming is probably too strong of a word, but, but a very unique one, it's very easy to get lost in it and instead spend the next, you know, five minutes playing in this environment as opposed to being a tool for input that we want it to be. So we are aiming for a, a meeting. And at the end of the day, it's not all about this virtual experience. There's a lot of real world things that we need to not forget about. Maybe this is just me approaching this as a hammer looking at a lot of nails and just focusing on the technology. Sometimes it can be easy to forget about all the other things. One of the things I really like to do in all of the experiences is to output the virtual reality display to a large external monitor. I usually run this off of a laptop and you know, it's a fairly modest size screen. But if you have the ability to bring another monitor or even a projector and show the rest of the audience that's waiting what to expect, it can go a long way both to generate support, maybe keep people in line a little bit longer uh, and get them excited about it, but also it, it provides a way to help them ease into their own experience. They know what to expect. They can see the design from at least a third person perspective. So they, they can be a little more acclimated to it by the time they get in there and be more effective when you're trying to solicit input from them. Space setup. That clear space that you defined during the room setup phase likes to have a physical counterpart in the real world in addition to just being empty. I would say ropes or kind of those uh, velvet ropes are obviously a really simple thing to do. At a bare minimum, you want to have something visual so there's like tape that you've outlined on the floor so at least you know people moving through the space can, can see that and, and maybe walk around it. An area rug is another really good one and that I like a lot because it also provides a tactile element for the user so that their feet can detect the difference between the rest of the floor surface and this area rug that they've been standing on so they know when they're starting to get out of bounds as well. Tables and chairs. Uh, people are going to need to wait. You need to make sure that there are chairs. You need to make sure there's tables for, for external monitors, for laptops, for all that kind of stuff to be there. So don't, don't over, overlook the obvious things. Um, you're going to need some level of extension cables. I have yet to have one of these events in which I'm not running an extension cable from halfway down the hall to get power out to, this, uh, out to all this equipment. And then the last thing, of course, is a large external display, which we've covered.